thanks for having me here tonight. I'm very happy to present, uh, as Ben mentioned, on uh, the programs that we currently have at the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, uh, specifically for solar PV. So uh, I'll be focusing tonight on the Alberta Municipal Solar Program and the Solar for Schools Program. Uh, so for those that don't know uh, about the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, we were established in 2009 um, and operate as a partnership between the Government of Alberta, uh, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association and Rural Municipalities of Alberta, uh, which is the uh, rural equivalent of that association. Um, the center has been funded since that time from grants by the government of Alberta, uh, as well as Energy Efficiency Alberta, uh, and we're currently delivering on a grant that we received in 2018. Uh, as Ben mentioned, this is our 10 year anniversary, so we have been around uh, the province for quite some time now uh, and have compiled some statistics this year uh, on our impact in the province to date. So as you can see here, uh, we've had what I like to think is a pretty decent impact in that time. Um, we've had participation in our programs from 130 municipalities. So uh, for context, there's uh, over 350 municipalities in Alberta. So um, we'd obviously like to see that continue to grow uh, over the years, but pretty significant uh, penetration there. Uh, 400 projects have received funding uh, through our center over the years. Uh, we have lifetime GHG reductions of 227,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and lifetime energy savings of $40 million attributed to our programs. Uh, so first up, as I mentioned, uh, we'll talk about the Alberta Municipal Solar Program. Uh, you can see here in the background one of the projects that we funded through this program uh, at the Wheatland County Administration Building. Uh, this was a 60.2 kilowatt system from 2017, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the process that a project like this would go through to receive our funding uh, and go through a few more case studies as well. So uh, the Alberta Municipal Solar Program launched uh, its first round of funding in 2016 with a $5 million grant from the Government of Alberta. Uh, it was fully subscribed in 2018 and we're now continuing on with the second round of that program uh, from the grant that we received in 2018. Uh, this program round is approaching full subscription. It's been very popular, uh, but as of today, there is still funding available and we are accepting applications on a first come first serve basis. So. Um, if there's any installers in the room that are still curious about whether there's funding available, I can confirm that as of today there is. Um, eligibility in this program, uh, it's a program eligible to all urban and rural municipalities in Alberta, as well as what we call community related organizations uh, or CROs. So that's basically things like community leagues and other types of nonprofits that operate out of municipally owned facilities. Um, for those of you obviously in this room, most of you are from Edmonton, I assume. A uh, number of the community leagues in Edmonton have participated through our program and you'll see if you go around town to any of them do have solar on the roof. So that's been uh, a cool success story there. Um, so systems through our program uh, basically need to be paid for and owned by the participating municipality for their life. Uh, they need to be located on a facility or parcel of land owned by the participating municipality. Uh, and they need to be grid connected systems that are compliant with the Alberta's microgeneration regulations. So uh, basically this just means that they're systems that are designed to offset energy use for those facilities or for those loads. Uh, these are not power plants as some of the other presenters tonight will probably cover. Um, so just basically self use for that solar. Uh, so the funding structure, the way the program operates is on a, an incentive basis uh, per watt installed. So uh, as you can see here, there's a bit of a table describing how that breaks out. Um, it's a sliding scale of rebates based on the size of system being installed. Uh, and that's basically just to take account for economies of scale that come into play with solar installations. Uh, you gain some efficiencies uh, in cost as the systems are bigger. Uh, so this just scales proportionally to that to basically level out the rebate depending on the size of the system that you're installing. Uh, and the rebate for any of our projects is capped at a maximum of 30% of eligible expenses. Uh, so one incentive we're running right now uh, is the first time applicant bonus. So this started in the uh, most recent round of the program that we're offering uh, and basically was designed to uh, offer an, an additional incentive to municipalities that haven't installed a solar PV system before hopefully to sort of lower that perceived risk that they might see in exploring a new technology um, and get them familiar with it enough to then feel more comfortable moving forward with additional projects after that. Uh, so it's an additional 25 cents per watt that's available 
to those first time applicants. Um, and that's calculated on top of that previous rebate that I mentioned, up to $250,000. Uh, and we feel it's been pretty successful. With this bonus, there's been 18 new municipalities uh, take advantage of the funding opportunity since it's come into place. So. Uh, just some statistics on participation. So for this program specifically, we've had 38 municipalities participate uh, for a total of 88 projects. So municipalities can participate with more than one project. Um, there's been annual GHG reductions of 13,270 tons of CO2 uh, and approved capacity of 18 megawatts. So uh, about 10 megawatts of that has been constructed already and would have been included in the graphs uh, that were shown at the beginning for Alberta's installed capacity. Uh, the remaining eight uh, that we have currently approved are just under construction right now and would be complete within the next year. Uh, so this just provides you a bit of a breakdown of the participation that we've seen in the program per municipality type. So um, it's not uncommon that people think a program like this will only be taken advantage of by large cities, uh, which as you can see is not the case here. We actually have towns um, just barely out competing cities in terms of the number of projects installed, which is great. Um, cities obviously are there in a sizable amount and we do have representation from municipal districts and counties as well as villages. Uh, so between all of those, that covers all the municipality types in Alberta. Um, so we're very pleased to see that we've had uptake across the board. Uh, so this is just some overall statistics that uh, some of you in the room may be interested about as well. Um, the program has seen, seen an average price per watt of $2.50, so uh, prices continuing to come down for solar um, as time goes on, which is great to see. Uh, the average system size through the program is 213 kilowatts. Uh, the largest, I believe, don't have it off the top of my head, but is approaching two megawatts. So there's quite, uh, quite a size uh, variety in there as well. Um, the program so far has installed 48,442 modules uh, and has lifetime emission reductions equivalent to 329 million pounds of coal burned. So um, along with all those great energy savings that municipalities are seeing, also a lot of emissions reductions. Uh, so I'm just going to jump into talking about a few specific case studies, examples of projects that have participated in the program. Um, the first one that you may have seen a little bit of press around in the last couple months is the town of Raymond. So uh, they completed a project uh, which did end up going around uh, in the news media. Uh, so you may have seen a little bit about that. This was uh, a net zero municipality project, as they like to call it, and I'll explain a little bit about what that means here. Uh, so in total, the town installed 1.16 megawatts of solar across nine systems. Uh, it was a total cost of $2.78 million, and they received $643,000 of funding from our program. Um, their achievement here is that they are Canada's first electrically net zero municipality in their own operations. So um, essentially, all the systems that they've installed are offsetting the entire electricity use from the town in its own operations. So that includes all of the municipal facilities they own as well as uh, their street lights. So um, the sites that they installed on were their arena, aquatic center, golf course, athletic park, fire hall, public workshop, town hall, and water treatment plant. Uh, the photo that you're seeing here is of the two installs at their ath athletic park, one of which is this nice big uh, carport project. So um, there was a couple of these ground mount systems in the nine that they had, uh, which were large systems that they aggregated a bunch of other loads that they had uh, to offset, which was really a cool initiative to see. Um, the project as well uh, ended up being cash neutral for the municipality. They structured their payments uh, for the system in such a way that in addition with the funding they receive from us, uh, their monthly payments are equivalent to the energy savings that they get from their systems. So uh, it's actually no additional cost to them right off the bat, and uh, they'll see pretty significant savings once those systems are paid off. Uh, next is another one that did end up getting uh, a little bit of press as well, setting a different record, which I'll cover here. It's the city of Airdrie. Uh, and their Genesis Place, which is a giant recre recreation center that they have in Airdrie, uh, and the system that they installed there. 
so this project was 1.62 megawatts, uh, and it claimed the achievement of Canada's largest rooftop system at the time of install. Uh, I don't know if that's still the case with some of the recent systems that we've seen, but anyway, at the time of install, they had just barely claimed that, which was very exciting. Uh, so this was a project that had uh, over 3,000 solar PV modules installed on the roof, as well as there was another carport installed here. You can't see it in the photo. It's just finishing installation right now, uh, but that will be in the parking lot uh, to add some additional generation for them there as well. Um, so this project in total offsets a third of the recreation center's energy use. Uh, and since completing the solar project, they've also proceeded uh, to participate in a few of our other programs uh, for energy efficiency retrofitting, as well as purchasing uh, an electric ice resurfacer. So uh, they're really going all in on this facility to try and make it uh, as sustainable as possible, which is really great to see. Um, the emissions reduced from this system are equivalent to taking 222 cars off the road for each year it's operating. Uh, so again, really great emission reductions here along with the energy savings that the system uh, will see. Uh, so next I'm gonna jump into uh, our newest program, uh, which is the Solar for Schools program. Uh, this is a very similar program to the one I just mentioned, uh, with the exception being that the audience is schools rather than municipalities. Um, so you'll see here uh, in the background, Cochrane High School, and the 50 kilowatt installation that they completed this year, which was our first participant in the program. Uh, so this program launched in 2018 with $14 million incentive available uh, to schools in Alberta. Um, this is a new area for us, the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. Obviously, you can tell by our name, our focus has been largely municipalities. Up to this point, we've dealt a little bit with nonprofits as well, um, but we're trying our best now to sort of get in front of the right audiences uh, for school authorities around Alberta to make sure they're aware of this program. Um, so it does still have substantial funding remaining, and we're continuing as we are with the Municipal Solar Program to accept applications for this on a first-come, first-served basis. Uh, so eligibility for this program, uh, as I mentioned, to schools in Alberta that serve kindergarten to grade 12 and are classified by Alberta education uh, in school authorities as public separate francophone or charter. Um, there's an easy database online to check whether a school you might know of fits any of those definitions. Uh, similar to the other program, the system must be owned by the participating school authority and located on uh, their facility or land. <coughs> and it also needs to be uh, a microgeneration system, so a system designed to offset their energy consumption. Uh, the funding structure here, same type of structure as the first program that I mentioned, just slightly different incentive levels. So uh, scaling from $1.50 per watt for those less than 10 kilowatt systems <coughs> down to $1 per watt for uh, any that would get to as large as two to five megawatts. Uh, and the maximum rebate uh, for any of the projects through this program would be 50% of eligible expenses. Uh, so a quick example of a participant through this program, uh, the Medicine Hat Christian School Project, which was in the Medicine Hat Public School District, uh, completed this year. <coughs> uh, the cost for this system uh, it was 177 kilowatts, was $322,000. They received uh, the 50% incentive from us, uh, and by participating in our program, they had their payback reduced by eight years, which is great. Um, so the school and the executives and administration there had been interested in solar PV for uh, quite a while, but just weren't able to make things work um, until our program was announced. They quickly got in touch with us and were very eager to take advantage of the program at that point. So uh, we were happy to have them participate and be one of our first projects. Um, one of the aspects for participating in this program, as well as to uh, carry out an education initiative that involves the solar PV project with the students at the school. So um, we've seen that being met in a few different ways uh, and to how that's integrated into curriculum or other types of events. Uh, in this case, uh, the school decided to integrate solar PV specifically into their science curriculum uh, for grades five, six, and nine, um, which is great. And there's been, like I said, uh, a lot of interest specifically in that education component and how to make this uh, an ongoing part of engagement with the system for these projects. Uh, so coming up to the end of my time, just wanted to cover a few other things related to solar PV that we offer uh, at the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. So we have a number of resources on our website. <coughs> um, the first is how to choose a solar provider uh, document. 
um, that just basically gives you some best practices, tips and tricks for uh, finding who might be uh, the right fit for you in terms of your solar project. Uh, we've created a document for uh, a checklist for any entities that need to go through a request for proposal projects to tender uh, out their, their project. So uh, just gives basically tips and tricks again of things to ask for in selecting a good installer through that method. Uh, a number of different documents here um, on solar PV basics for the technology. Uh, we have best practices for permitting and taxation for municipalities as well as community engagement strategies um, and a solar calculator as well. Uh, lastly, I'll just end on uh, some of the other funding services I mentioned. So <clears throat> like I, I alluded to with the uh, Genesis Place project, uh, they're participating in a few of these initiatives as well. Uh, so we do have a funding program for energy efficiency retrofitting in uh, recreation centers and municipalities. Uh, we have the Electric Vehicles for Municipalities program, uh, the Municipal Energy Manager program, which is a staff capacity grant for municipalities, uh, and the Partners for Climate Protection program. Uh, and we will be sharing more about all of those initiatives uh, at the upcoming Alberta's Greenest Cities seminars uh, through Solar Alberta that were mentioned. So utility scale solar developments. Uh, my name is David De Bruin. I work with Alts Pro Electric. I'm a Red Seal master electrician as well and uh, a design build electrical contractor. We, we are headquartered here in Edmonton, but we operate all over Alberta. Um, you know, we have a large focus on the municipalities and uh, building schools here. Uh, but we're also involved in a lot of solar PV projects in the province and abroad. Uh, we're an NMAX solar dealer. Uh, so what that means is, uh, y you know, if you got a client that is looking for financing with a project, um, we can finance it turnkey at really low interest rates in the industry, um, you know, subpar, uh, or below 3%, uh, which is cheaper than a lot what the banks can offer. So it's a, it's a huge advantage to partner with these guys, um, really bringing the levelized cost of energy down low. Uh, so that's a little bit about myself. So the existing market conditions, um, you know, as Mark had said before, uh, the Alberta market gen regulation advantage, there's, um, there's a huge advantage we have here in Alberta. If you look to our neighbors to the left and to the right, um, you know, they're really pigeonholed to the, the generation capacity and the limits that they have here. So this has played a huge role in the advancement of our economy for uh, solar in the area. Um, so really thankful to have this. Um, it's been uh, really uh, instrumental in growing the industry. And the Alberta Open Market Advantage for energy developers, I'm, I'm not sure how much you guys follow the energy bills, but when you see you have your, um, you know, when, when it comes out your home, you have your transmission, uh, distribution, and energy charges. Uh, it's a little bit of a different layout than uh, other provinces, and it, it has its pros and cons. Um, but what it does do is promote uh, open market uh, uh, bidding on the energy rate. So if you can produce energy cheaper than, uh, than the other guys, uh, it really makes it easy to come in and, and get some of these projects online here. Also want to note the, uh, uh, the rapidly advancing supply chain. Um, so Ontario has had a huge boom uh, in uh, that part of Canada previous to us, and what that did is that really set up the manufacturing in that area, um, got a lot of the supply chains going and it really brings the, the cost of these projects down and that's key to uh, for the success of these projects um, just the, the flat out cost of the supply plays a massive role in making these successful projects so having that in, uh, in, in Canada previously and bringing that over to the Alberta market uh, is another key catalyst uh, going forward here. Another thing is the existing contractor base you know with the grant agencies from uh, Efficiency Alberta that has since kind of left us just recently uh, but with MCCAC still ongoing, there's a huge uh, amount of new solar companies that have started up in the area, and it is really good to have that, because uh, as these new projects come online, we need that installer base of, uh, of boots on the ground labor that has been experienced and can actually uh, execute on these projects. So it's good that we have these existing market conditions, and it's going to help play as we pivot into the future here with these new utility scale projects. So market shift, there's an energy commodity price increasing. Uh, in, in the past couple of years, it's been very, very record low pricing, uh, a lot of coal, and um, it's starting to increase and inflate a little bit, which is really good. It starts making that spread for the developers when they come in, uh, building these big solar projects, and with the market price of energy coming up and the cost of solar PV installations coming down, we're kind of at a crossroads now here in Alberta, uh, making it uh, viable for these developers to pull the trigger on their projects. So. Um, some good shift there as well. The um, certainty for carbon pricing uh, with the recent uh, with the liberals coming in, uh, putting a price on carbon. Um, it is a good thing. It, it helps these guys solidify 
uh, their long-term revenue projections on these projects. When you can sell your, your carbon and to uh, other sources, it helps make them a lot more financially stable and help them get financing. So that does help play a role in these um, projects coming online, as well as the capacity available. You know, other parts of the world, they struggle with actually providing uh, stable power to area. And we have a very uh, stable grid and we have some capacity that's left on here for these projects. So, you know, very thankful that we have that. Clearly by the stats coming in, we need a little bit more. There's, uh, I think, a lot more than what we banked on, which is a good thing, um, but we have the ability to deliver it. So that is good. For the next two points here, uh, it's, it is a buyer's market for PPAs coming in, and as well, there's a lot of volatility. So there's a lot of things going on in the energy rate. You have uh, coal coming uh, offline in a couple of years here. It's still very, very instrumental, but uh, with that phasing out, you have natural gas coming in on uh, some retrofits. You have a lot of wind in uh, southern Alberta coming online. And what that does is it starts to create a little bit of volatility in the energy price. And with that, it, it creates a little bit of uncertainty for large corporations when they get their energy bill and you know huge swings in what they're paying for energy is, is not conducive to the business. So they're going to go out and actually source a long-term contract to, to purchase the energy. Uh, and then with solar developers, uh, like some that are here today at the doorstep waiting, you know, they can sell this block of energy. It's, uh, it is a buyer's market, it's a double-edged sword, but at least uh, people are looking to uh, secure some long-term contracts. So it does help the market shift as we move on here. So looking forward to 2020 and beyond, there is a huge need for uh, skilled labor on these projects coming up. Um, in the past, we've had done some presentations, there are a lot of installers in the room. Is there, I guess, show of hands, is there anyone looking here for employment on, uh, towards solar installations, show of hands? There's going to be a huge need for that going forward. Um, I, some of these projects, you know, upwards of 600 men on a site, and you know, there's a lot of skilled labor that's going to be needed going forward. You know, there's a shift of jobs available. Uh, obviously, with the market, it's a little bit compressing with the oil and gas leaving us uh, uh, slowing down a little bit. It's still there, it's still very uh, key in our, our economy, but there's a lot of capacity left for a lot of workers here. Um, you know, even if you look at commercially, the the construction industry, it is contracting a little bit. So, as uh, you know, 2020 beyond and these utility scale projects come online, it might fill a little bit of the void, which is great. I have a little bit of transfer from skilled labor from those industries over. Alberta really is leading the charge in uh, the market uncertainty. Um, these uh, grant agencies have uh, done very well in helping kickstart the, uh, the solar economy. Um, I can't say enough how thankful we are to have them around. Uh, very sad to see uh, Efficiency Alberta go, but as, as Mark was saying, we still have a little bit left in MCCAC funding uh, to help uh, carry us through a little bit here. Maybe bug them, see if we can get some more, uh, more grants out of them. <laughs> Alberta has and will, will remain an energy province. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to see how much we have here and how lucky we are. You know, it's just another form of energy. Al Alberta is really strong in what we have here, and I'm excited to start tapping into that, uh, that resources that we have. You know, if we didn't have a lot of that pre-existing contractor base and knowledge base in the industry, bringing in utility-scale projects, they would come in at such a higher cost, and it would start to you know, turn the tables on feasibility. So it's very, very important to have that existing contractor base. Uh, and it does play a huge role as we expand into these uh, bigger utility scale projects. And there's a time-lapse video of uh, Canada's largest solar installation. So we uh, just had one that surpassed the, the ERG project. So 1.83 megawatt uh, just came online here uh, in the past weeks. It's on top of a, a new cannabis facility here in Atchison, Alberta. So it's pretty cool. Made uh, another mark here globally. Um, eight years ago when we started the company, I guess mostly been working on residential uh, scale projects, um, lots of off-grids, but now it's the uh, industry is shifting towards uh, utility scale, and the reason being is that um, solar is extremely competitive on a larger scale with uh, uh, other uh, types of generation, and um, uh, throughout the presentation, I hope you can see that uh, uh, we experiencing at this very moment uh, very rapid growth in utility scale projects, at least in, in interest in, in those. And uh, as Benjamin said, some of them will certainly go ahead. And uh, uh, we've been involved in many of them as well already, and uh, we'll be happy to share with you. So a little bit about myself. Um, uh, as Benjamin said, uh, I, uh, uh, I co-founder of uh, Dandelion Renewables, which is Alberta-based company as well. Uh, as well, three years ago we started a Saskatchewan-based company, which is solar plantation, uh, which is specializing more on um, engineering side of things as well. And uh, in Alberta, we've been involved in the Brook Solar Project, which is 17 megawatt in um, layout and foundation, um, pre-drilling, uh, 
uh, concrete fill, so and things like that, uh, uh, pea gravel fill. And uh, on solar plantation, we've got uh, some exciting uh, projects in Saskatchewan. So we recently uh, fi finalized and um, uh, energized the project, our own project. So we purchased the land and uh, built uh, some smaller solar farm. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to in fa um, uh, tell you that last year I was talking about, um, on a similar topic, I was talking about three provinces, and um, this year we'll just focus on Alberta, because Alberta does becoming a powerhouse of entire Canada. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, for that is that the coal is coming, coming out, and uh, no matter what policies and regulations and anything we have, the Alberta market is deregulated, so it's based on the supply demand. If some supply comes out offline, there's something needs to replace it. And it's just a question what kind of technology going to replace it. It comes quite obvious that uh, solar and potentially with the storage in the future can compete on this marketplace. And um, uh, in addition to the picking units, I do hope that uh, lots of renewables going to be added in the near future as well. So here, again, last year I was uh, struggling to put this second slide and going through entire three provinces, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So this time I had to, I have, I have to actually select some projects and some, to take some projects out of the list because it was too many for one pager. Um, and um, I will uh, clarify two things. So first one is that definition, what is uh, under construction? in my world is a little bit maybe premature. So um, we, in solar plantation, we're involved in lots of uh, pile testing and uh, foundation engineering. So when the company um, have very initial interest in the project and actually putting uh, foot in the ground and getting the piles in and do the testing. So I'm considering that, you know, they actually broke the ground and uh, started construction because they did put the, uh, you know, so, uh, substantial uh, interest in proceeding. Um, again, there's things can happen in between between then and now that may prevent the project to move ahead. But uh, we think that uh, fairly confident those projects will go ahead because they are um, been working on the ground already, not necessarily in the you know full construction scope. Some of them, and second thing is that you know even though we've been involved in some of the projects, I have to stick with the public media, so I have to only present um, information that's not confidential. So some of the numbers um, I try to. Uh, get as much as I can from different sources, uh, so just uh, keep it in mind uh, so it's not a pure mathematical accurate numbers, but it would show you very important trends. And uh, those trends are, as you can see, um, we're starting with um, uh, smaller scale projects in 2015, slowly going to, in 2017, to the Brooks, which is 17 megawatt, and this capacity is AC capacities. Um, and dollars per watt is also a dollar per AC watt capacity, uh, which is kind of more correct way to calculate uh, it. And as you can see, then um, uh, projects goes to right, ra roughly to 20 megawatt range, and then jumping into 130 and 400 megawatt project, in which is expected to be completed in 2021, which is a Traverse project. As you can understand, uh, there is economy of scale building larger project, so you gain more um, for. Uh, um, to saving on the cost if you build a, a bigger project. And that drives the economics, better economics. And uh, um, Greengate project uh, Travers is actually uh, really proof of that, that uh, uh, in terms of the price, they came, uh, announced price is uh, only $1.25 um, per watt, which is a very, very, um, very aggressive number, which uh, if you use this number to calculate level of cost of energy and they can stay within the budget, then this project uh, seems to be making, making economic sense. Um, also, what I'd like to notice is that as we go through the time, the technology has been changing. So the early projects, including Brooks project, were fixed modules and monocrystalline. Um, and uh, going down the line, you can see that uh, some of the projects are single axis. And some of the projects uh, using bifacial modules, and some of them using both bifacial and uh, single axis. So as te technology evolving, and especially in Alberta market, as I'll show you, um, it's kind of important to utilize all tools that we have in the baggage to maximize the uh, project's return on investment. Uh, those projects, uh, not all of them, you know, kind of very easy and simple. So as um, uh, previously mentioned, uh, in order to implement that much large capacity of the solar in Alberta, we do need to have manpower. And some of the projects here listed, uh, they've been preceded with uh, 
you know, with attempt uh, not involving solar professionals just because of the lack of uh, uh, local labor. And um, it is definitely a challenge um, to, to find the labor in these scales. Like even, for example, 400 megawatt project, it would utilize both labor and materials and rentals and equipment. So it's gonna be a, a fairly significant uh, stretch and hopefully we can build capacity by the time the project uh, in the full uh, construction stage to, to fulfill that. So um, yeah, and then um, out of these eight projects, uh, so we've been involved uh, in four, and uh, one of the project, which is Town of Viking, is uh, funded by MCCC program, which is uh, right now the construction, so we're doing piling. Uh, so it's one megawatt, we're using bifacial modules, we're planning to commission uh, early spring 2020, and um, you can see that the price is about uh, $1.70 watt. Uh, so that uh, you know reflects a um, substantial, I think, drop in the market price for, for the equipment, as well as uh, finding the way to optimize, uh, optimize the angle, optimize the performance, uh, optimize the installation time, um, I think there's still ways to learn, for example, German examples and such. And uh, also, it's, it's kind of working both ways. Some of the companies um, that you can see here got uh, experience from Ontario, got experience from Europe. They get into Alberta market and they do find some challenges related to the Canadian cold winters and uh, uh, foundation designs and such and such. So there's still quite a steep learning, cur learning curve. and. Uh, I truly hope that uh, the projects that I listed will uh, complete, be completed successful and will be a good story at the end of the day. So what uh, key drivers for Alberta solar economics? So as mentioned before, we've got uh, subsidy-free um, uh, solar projects that utility scale. So what is good is that there's not much to lose, you know, <laughs> because incentives comes and go, and uh, it's uh, extremely volatile and uh, risky to rely on them for developers. But uh, if we're talking about just free delegate market, it does provide kind of security for the, uh, for the, uh, for the economics. If you plan that's gonna be the economics reg regarding the political impact, that's usually the case. Uh, it also brings the challenges because the regulated market is extremely volatile, so nobody knows what the price is gonna be in the year two, three, four down the road. Um, it's difficult to forecast, um, and um, obviously someone need to take that market risk. Um, that makes it difficult to finance the projects. Uh, typically, by banks would like um, something more secure than exposure to the very wild, volatile Alberta power prices. Then another driver, as I mentioned, is uh, technology is changing, and uh, solar price is going down. Um, next thing is that uh, the structure of the market. So we have deregulated energy only market, which is favorable for the solar. It doesn't recognize necessarily the value of the capacity that you bring. And um, the previous government been introducing the idea, idea of the capacity market, which uh, has been understanding scrapped. Um, so it looks like we're gonna stay in the energy only market, which is uh, not bad idea, for, <laughs> not, not bad for economics of the solar. Next thing is high capture price. What happens, uh, and I'll explain you later in the slides, is that uh, solar tend to shine at the time of the day when the power price is higher. So you cannot uh, just make your economics based on the average pool price uh, throughout the year. You actually need to look at uh, each hour separately and see what revenue you're gonna get. And um, it's actually really helping um, uh, for the, for the to justify high returns. Next thing that's mentioned, greenhouse gas offsets. I think uh, everybody recognizes in such a way that uh, uh, climate change is going and I don't think in the long term that's going to uh, come off the plate. So it's uh, good to have it and have recognition of the renewable energy being different than um, uh, generation from fossil fuels. And fun finally, uh, development of the storage, energy storage technology is uh, absolutely crucial for the future development of the renewable energy because uh, in renewable energy, like wind, solar, run of river, it's intermittent, so you don't know when it's gonna be exactly uh, producing. However, we all rely on the light and we need to rely on the, to turn the light at the time when we need, not when it's sunny or, or windy. So uh, it's absolutely instrumental once the penetration of renewable energy is gonna be sub substantial in the grid that uh, storage, uh, storage technology comes up. On the next slide, I would like to explain a little bit more about uh, solar capture price. As you can see, um, what we've done is um, uh, on the green is the uh, profile for the load consumption in, in Alberta. 
we do have a peak around uh, evening, 5 p.m., when usually people come uh, home and turn on the lights and turn on the equipment. Also, you can see that generally there is a higher consumption during the day when industrial and commercial customers are utilizing the power. And that fairly well coincides with the uh, solar power profile. What we have is um, we had a system that we monitor every, every hour, and we built a profile for that system. It's a ground mount system installed 45 degrees. And you can, um, as you can see, there is quite a bit of correlation. So if we measure that correlation uh, throughout the year, um, going back in the history, that system has been installed in 2012, so we do have full data from 2013 and on and we correlate it with the uh, average pool price. So at the time when the, there is a little bit of shortage of the supply or high demand, uh, the power prices tend to be extremely volatile, and that actually helps solar to capture high prices. As you can see in 2013, there was um, average uh, pool price was around $80 per megawatt hour, while uh, solar captured almost twice more than, than, than 80. And then in 2016-17, there was a little bit over supply on the market and uh, lower demand. Um, that would br brought uh, solar to capture pretty much the same as an average price. Now we're kind of in the recovery mode where there is uh, maybe 15-20% premium uh, to, the, um, to the price that solar captures compared to uh, average pool price. And um, another thing that I would like to mention, you know, the prices on the projects that I mentioned um, do fluctuate quite a bit, and uh, um, we pretty much between the average pool price and the capture price from globalized cost of energy. So, um, so that makes uh, you know very uh, attractive for for solar going forward. Technology is evolving, and I would like to touch base on a, a couple of, couple of them. So, one is uh, bifacial modules. So, when we build a project in Saskatchewan, we specifically wanted to test and measure uh, bifacial uh, gains. And we've done it so, uh, so you can see kind of limited data that uh, we have we energized the project in September in terms of how bifacial helps to uh, widen up the profile for the solar. And actually helping, um, it's uh, providing better correlation with Alberta pool prices because you can get production from solar later in the day when the, when the loads is higher. So that's one of the way to look at it. Uh, single access, we didn't build any single access projects, so if someone of you guys decide to, you want to do single access, we'd be happy to practice and uh, analyze the data. But the idea is that single access um, is, uh, um, so, uh, sorry, maybe i just give you a really quick uh, a definition of the bifacial module. Bifacial module has uh, both a front and the back of the module producing electricity. It comes that um, in this marketplace to put the white back sheet on the module is almost costing the same as to put another um, uh, layer of the cells on the back of the module. So from cost perspective, you don't get much premium for the bifacial module. You do put a second layer of the glass and such, but um, you got quite a bit of uh, um, gain in energy given that we have a cold uh, climate and we have uh, quite a bit of snow coverage with uh, high reflection rates. Also, bifacial modules do tend to produce power um, early in the, er, very early in the morning, like 6.30 in the morning uh, in the summertime when the sun comes from the back and shining to the back of the modules. Um, single axis uh, is another technology which, uh, with the rows of the modules going north to south and the modules turning this way, so assuming this is south and the sun, so the modules sitting this way and just turning this way, right? So it does help to widen up the distribution profile for the solar, which is going to help to um, capture high price for the solar and uh, capture the peak around 6, 5 p.m., which is uh, fixed uh, tilt doesn't, doesn't do. Another thing is uh, I haven't seen it yet, but um, I'm hoping that some utility scale projects would recognize that uh, it is uh, valuable to optimize the azimuth to get closer to the evening peak to shave it off. And finally, just really briefly, I would like to touch base on the Traverse uh, a 400 megawatt project. Solar Plantation, our company, has been selected uh, to provide the owner's engineer services on the foundation side of, of things. So we've been working with uh, GreenGate uh, for the last couple of months on that. And um, it just, uh, you know, the scale of the project is completely, uh, you know, just hard to, just, hard, hard to even encompass. Um, when we built the Brooks Solar Project, it was 80 acres of land. 
Here we're talking about 5,000 acres of land. It's just, you know, just even like moving equipment around and just walking from one end to the project to another project, they just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not feasible. So, so the scale is uh, absolutely phenomenal. It's gonna uh, take 1.5 million solar modules to build and about half a billion dollar worth of investment. So it's, I think it just, uh, I'm really hoping this is a, you know, going to be a positive, successful story. And uh, with that scale of the project, if, if, we, if we as a province uh, get this project completed successfully, I think we will be a set force for, for, the, for, the, for the other stack that <laughs> Benjamin's shown and, and uh, been really good. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much Benjamin and the team for having me here. i um, excited to be speaking about Alberta being the solar powerhouse for Canada. It's a really exciting time, as he said, for us because one of the projects actually that Mikhail had talked about was our Suffield project, which, we, which is under construction now. So it was just interesting to see from your view what other things are, are happening in the market. Another interesting thing you spoke about was the single access by facial, which is something that we're doing on our project as well. So it's exciting to share this information with you. So for those who may not be familiar with uh, Canadian solar, we're top three solar power companies in, company in the world. Um, currently, we operate across about 20 countries and we're, we're distributing modules as well to over 100 countries globally. Um, if you see, you'd see that some of the plant, power plants we've uh, Built so far is about 4.6 gigawatts of power. I know we're very far from that in Canada, but that number is even closer to about five now. Just um, a lot of that is coming from the United States and uh, LATAM as well, and we have some operations in the Middle East. Um, so that's another interesting uh, thing that we're seeing. Um, on, in the US, uh, we operate under a brand called Recurrent Energy. Um, we, Canadian Solar acquired Recurrent Energy in 2015, and we continue to run some projects, uh, a lot of projects actually in the U.S. Um, just a bit about some of the projects that we're seeing across the world. It's always good to get a sense of what's going on, get a sense of what the future might be as well in Alberta and across Canada at some point. You see massive projects over there. You see well, 53 megawatts of power in uh, Japan. There is a uh, recently closed uh, 102 megawatts as well in North Carolina. Very, um, that was very exciting for us. And also in November, we've done 190 megawatts of solar in Brazil and also about 266 in Texas. So hopefully we get there in Alberta. It's coming and, and Mikhail has already shown all the different projects that are coming on stream. So exciting time for us. So um, this is uh, our key project under construction in Alberta right now, the Suffield Solar Project. And it's 32 megawatts of power in Suffield, in Cypress County, Alberta. And it's right off uh, Highway 1 around uh, Range Road 101. So it's, it's actually 15, about 15 minutes drive from the Brook Solar Project that's uh, out there as well. Um, one of the interesting things about the Suffield Project before we get to technology is, uh, is the project was, is a bit de-risked because you have a contracted PPA for about 10 years, and that's with a direct energy, which is, uh, you might already be familiar with direct energy, um, very large energy uh, company in North America, and a subsidiary of Centrica PLC. So having that, um, having that come in as a 10-year PPA for an investment grade um, off-taker, what you find is that investors and lenders are a bit more interested in actually lending some money and some funding to the projects because they see that there has been some contracted revenue so you're not 100% exposed to the market. So that's an interesting thing for us on the Suffield project. Interconnection at this site is going to be with uh, Fortis Alberta. And we're currently working with uh, an experienced EPC provider. Unfortunately, I can't say who at the moment uh, to deliver on that project. and. Um, it is in construction now, which is exciting. As far as equipment goes, we are we have a bifacial model single access tracking on Suffield, and that is essentially going to 
it's innovation in solar in Alberta because it's not something that has been done before. And and one of the one of the things that did was that it enabled us to get some funding from Natural Resource Canada under their uh, Emerging Renewable Power Program. I always I, I I say ERPP, but just to just to say it in full. So we got about fifteen million dollars in funding because of the innovation of using bifacial modules in the in the province. So that was also an exciting thing for us, which is when you get that kind of funding for a project, then you're more encouraged to take that risk and explore using innovative technology here in in Alberta. The, one of the benefits of using bifacial, as uh, Mikhail has already spoken about, is the fact that it, it works much better than traditional models because in the winter months you're getting an albedo benefit with the reflection of the snow. So that's a very good thing that we're, we're, uh, we're looking to see materialize and just track how well that works in, in, in Alberta. Um, and we're also doing on the Suffield project the the single axis tracking as well so that the project is able to sort of follow the sun and the ultimate goal is to maximize output and just make sure that we're generating uh, as much power as possible. Once this comes on stream, hopefully in 2020, it's going to be the largest utility scale project in Alberta, which is also exciting. Um, Brook Solar is currently now at, I think, 17 megawatts peak, and Suffield is 32 megawatts peak, so that's really exciting. It's almost uh, twice the size of that, so for us, it's a really exciting to be at the forefront of pushing just power, solar power here in Alberta, so that's exciting for us. The second set of projects we have coming on stream in Alberta as well is what we're calling the Alberta Infrastructure Project. And why that is, is as you said, as your, one of the things you worked on was the, the, the provincial government had, gone, had opened up the auction, competitive auction process for to get, I think, about 135,000 megawatt hours of, of power projects for, for the province. And the goal was to fund about 55% of the electricity needs for the, for the province. And we were successful in February 2019 of getting that contract. And it really, really, it was a really exciting process because the government listened to what the market was saying, which is we need, we need more sort of like a seal of approval that solar energy is here to stay and that the province is behind it. And we need something that we can take back to lenders and investors and show them, okay, so this project is a bit de-risked, so go ahead, give us some money, and then let's be able to fund this project. And so you see that it has a long PPA, which is 20 years, 20 year PPA contracted, and that is, that is a, a dream for investors looking to come into solar. And we actually have seen that there's just been, not just within Canada, but just international uh, investments that are looking at this project, especially looking at three projects as a whole. Three together is about 94 megawatts peak of power. So you have people saying, okay, we want the bundle of power because you have almost 100 megawatts for a single contract. We're interested in that. So that's also a very um, exciting thing to... Okay, so um, I guess some of the success for getting this contract would have been because we were already pretty advanced in developing in developing projects here in Alberta. So luckily by the time the Alberta infrastructure procurement came on stream, we were already a bit advanced. So we had three projects that we could then serve that 135,000 megawatt hour need. So that was really exciting for us. And one of the other interesting, th exciting things about this project was that, as you said, it gave the market finally a price that we can then start discussing as a, for power. You have 48, about $48 per megawatt hour as a contracted price, so that made everyone realize, okay, we're serious about bringing down the cost of solar. If that's where we're going, then, then we can do that. But that's also because it's a 20-year PPA with the government as, your, as the off-taker, which is, again, it's a dream for de-risking a project. Because we're all over the world, you, you kind of ask, okay, why Alberta? Why are we actually looking at projects in Alberta? And some of that, when we come to Canada, and some of that is obviously because of Alberta's deregulated market. There's nothing that sort of hinders a company from being able to develop this kind of technology in a new market if there is some sort of monopoly. So having that 
deregulated market where we can actually enter into contracts very and actually be in a competitive uh, process, that's a very big advantage uh, for Canadian solar and for other companies that are looking at utility scale projects in Canada. The second thing, obviously, is the great solar resource. Um, Alberta and Saskatchewan, I believe, have the greatest solar resource um, in Canada. And also when you look at the I want to say when you look at the top topography of uh, Alberta as well, you see relatively flat land, and that's also good and reduces some of the cost when you're building out because you know that you're going to be able to build out your project on relatively flat land and not have to deal with like the mountains. If you were like in a BC, you have to cut through some uh, some valleys and some mountains to get the project set up. So that would impact the cost. So that's a good thing for us when we're looking at where to site all these projects. And that's why Alberta is a, is a good, is a good uh, location for Canadian solar. Um, another thing is also tied to the deregulated market, which is the open bilateral PPA market, where we know we can enter into a contract with a company and have them actually contract the revenue. So not all of your uh, revenue that's coming from the project will be tied to the volatile merchant market for power. So that's another uh, another good thing for us for, in Alberta. And obviously the planned coal retirements by 2030 means that there is demand. They're looking for, everyone's looking for cleaner options and more options to go to and why not solar when we have a great resource, when we have the space for it and when we're engaging with community partners and they're able to say, okay, bring solar to our area and this is how we, this is how, uh, we see it working. So that's another reason why we're looking and excited about Alberta for solar. One of the things I thought also to share is just our key learnings to date, just on the projects we're working on. One of the first thing is that we're seeing that there's a lot of global, strong global investment interest in Alberta. And even more importantly is that the investors or the investors in projects are excited to get in a bit early on the project. So they want to be part of that process to see, okay, who's the EPC provider and what are they doing? Does it meet our own standards in our own, in our own uh, facilities, wherever else in the world they are? And especially when they have some experience with similar projects, you're finding that they just want to get involved a lot earlier and just be a part of the process. And that's a, that's a stamp of approval that we're doing something right if they want to get involved in, in the projects early on. Um, a second thing we're, we're seeing also is that it's important to prioritize quick execution, especially for projects like this, mostly because you see that there's a, there's continuous change in regulation. So the more we delay a project, you might have people that are willing to lend to the, to the project, and that's, that's one of the considerations, considerations for utility scale, right? Because you have these massive projects, you want to get some debt capital into it, get some equity capital into it, so we can actually pay to build out these projects. So if it's not executed quickly, what we find is that regulations change, and then those term sheets that you've already negotiated, they change because people are not as convinced that you can actually deliver the project to the scale and with the returns that you started off with. So that's another thing that we're thinking as well at Canadian Solar to just prioritize quick execution and get on the ground moving and try to turn these things around very, very quickly. The other part of it also is obviously when you have the long winters that like we do, you have the winter times you have to build in and that's pretty expensive for any, any project developer is having to build in the winter. So that's another reason to prioritize our quick execution. Uh, third thing is de-risking of the project. I've spoken a bit about that on a funding side, which is focused on securing PPAs or power purchase agreements that are longer term. So the Alberta infrastructure one would be one that's one of that. A 20 year term is very good for a project developer. That's the kind of, that's, those are the kind of agreements we want to get into because it de-risks the projects for on a lending perspective and just on a cash flow perspective. Another thing is making sure that there's an investment grade off taker like the government of Alberta, like direct energy, just to make sure they're good for their word, right? So if they say they're going to offtake the energy, are they really going to offtake it? Is there going to be some sort of breach of contract? That's another thing that lenders and investors are always looking at when we're developing projects and just showcasing that to them. 
Another part is early tests and surveys on the sites. So I, I, we're, we're at Suffield Solar with 170 acres, I believe. I can't imagine what the Travis Solar Project would be because you find all sorts of things, especially in Alberta. You find abandoned wells, you find, and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of uh, focus on wildlife as well in Alberta. So regulation is a big piece of the utility scale project. So you find a hawk nest in your project and then you're held up. You can't do anything until the, the eggs are finished nesting and the bird flies away and you can't disturb it. So those are the kind of things you would actually find in utility scale projects that no one thinks about, right? You just think you build a project on flat land, but there might be birds and then you can't build. So that's another thing to, to sort of consider for utility scale pro, um, projects. Another thing, uh, part of the risk in the project is to engage early with the regulators. That's another thing that's really important because a lot of people, a lot of projects get hung up in the regulatory piece because there are so many inputs that flow into different approvals. You have an AUC uh, appro uh, approval, but you have other things that feed into that. Have you done your noise impact assessment? Have you done your wildlife survey? What is the soil looking like? And have you set back enough from the wetlands on the site? Those are all things that you can't take for granted and you have to plan well in advance for. So that's a lot of what we're seeing for utility scale projects in Alberta is to just get engaged really early with the regulators and so that we know to the extent in which we can change our, our project, for instance. Now we're saying we're a single axis tracking or a bifacial model, uh, modules. Can we switch to monofacial? Likely not, because the approval is for bifacial. So those are the kind of things that you face when you get to utility scale, is you get those approvals, and those approvals are those approvals. To, to switch anything out in the project, you would have to literally start again. So that's, uh, that's one of our learnings uh, from what we're doing out here in Alberta. Uh, that, I guess I've spoken a bit about innovative funding structures with our getting the grant from Enercan for $15 million. That's always exciting, getting that kind of capital in. So that's another thing we're finding that will be, will help to sort of help utility scale projects be successful in Alberta is go and look at, look out for some, uh, funding structures. As far as outlook on Alberta goes, um, we've already heard some views around the room and this largely echoes some of that. For us as well, just because we operate internationally, we like to also look at what other people are looking at coming in. And one of that we're seeing is just a growing interest from eco-conscious buyers. So you have U.S. companies that have already fulfilled all their emission requirements in the U.S. and are now looking to Canada to offset some of some of those. You see the likes of Starbucks and um, I think Grupo Bimbo. I think they released an RFP to try to buy some renewable energy credits uh, three about three four months ago and. For us, that's just a good sign that we can continue to build and we don't only have to market or sell the entire attributes of a solar project. So you can contract the revenue here, but we can sell some of the renewable energy credits. All that means is that you're getting even more cash flow for your project, you're getting even more return. So that's uh, one of the things we're seeing. Again, coal retirement is likely to drive demand as people look for more of an energy mix and more of a clean mix and solar is already making big strides, so why not just do solar? That's another thing we're seeing. And obviously just a Canada-wide renewable energy policy. We're seeing that continue to drive demand for solar and continue to drive the industry actually growing. So that's another exciting thing. Another one we're seeing also is growing interest from cost-conscious businesses. And what that is, is a business already exists, so a manufacturer already exists, and they want to reduce their utility costs, so they incorporate solar in their in their projects. So um, I think you showed us the carports. That's one of the things that companies are considering, which is, okay, let's throw on some, uh, some, car, uh, some solar panels on the carports and minimize some of our some of our costs especially if you think about our moving to let me not say moving to uh, dabbling into electric vehicles you'd see that those charging stations are probably going to have solar panels to power some of the energy that's been generated from that so a lot of a lot of that will continue to drive the increasing demand for solar in Alberta we're finding as far as a potential oversupply, this just goes to like what happened in 2016. If just if there's just so much 
supply of energy, this likely, likely to affect some costs, drop costs significantly and make it not be as uh, successful for utility projects, but a bit of caution, just one of the cons, but we're seeing mostly pros in terms of uh, and renewable um, solar energy in Alberta. The final thing is just strong fundamentals of solar at scale. It's like um, has been spoken already today. As, as, as we're getting to larger sizes of solar projects, we're seeing that cost start to come down. And as we continue to do it prov province-wide and I guess worldwide, we will just continue to see that cost drop and then we'll see more projects being done that are more profitable and just continue to drive solar energy in, in, in the province and across Canada. Thank you, everyone. So, Mark, just knowing that you've got your ear to the ground on municipalities and their interest in solar energy, um, and you gave us a great overview of what municipalities have done to own their own solar through your program at MCCAC, um, I have a two, bit of a two-part question. First, what do you see as the lay of the land going forward for municipal participation in new solar development? And then, relatedly, does that participation include involvement in one form or another with the utility scale boom that we've heard a bit about tonight? So. Um, obviously, my presentation and our program covers uh, strictly microgeneration projects for municipalities, uh, which we obviously have seen quite a bit of uptake in. Um, and I think the program obviously helped facilitate that to some degree, but uh, I am pretty confident that beyond the funding opportunities we have, uh, that solar is going to be continuing to be a, a point of focus for municipalities moving forward, especially on the microgeneration side, uh, with the economics just coming down in the, in the way that they are and, and making economic sense. Municipalities are always looking at ways to uh, save energy uh, and save specifically money on the energy that they spend to free that up for other operations given their, their limited budgets. So I think that will continue as the economics continue to make sense. Um, Particularly the projects through our program have really started to see the domino effect across the province. Uh, the Raymond project, for example, um, really really started a, a sort of sequence of events in the communities around it. They all pay close attention to what one another are doing. So uh, once there was an example set in the area of a municipality that was really able to make solar work in a very real feasible way, um, the other communities surrounding them very much wanted to follow suit and were, were very quick to get in touch with us and ask how that might be possible. So. Uh, I think we'll continue to see that um, just continue on beyond any funding programs. And remind me of the second half of the Yeah, question. sure. It's um, the potential for interest of in municipalities in the utility scale boom. So it's not something that they're really directly involved in. I mean, they're, they are major electricity consumers. They might be interested in a hedge, but that's the thinking. I'm wondering if there's interest yeah. there. Yeah, so um, beyond microgeneration, uh, we are seeing quite a bit of interest from municipalities on uh, not quite the utility scale level yet, but in a space, uh, what we're calling community generation in Alberta now, which is on the uh, distribution scale. So um, municipalities are looking to see what the options are for being involved in ownership of uh, larger systems that aren't just providing energy for their own operational use, but uh, as more on the power plant side, providing energy that they can use uh, as a revenue source. So. Um, we have other programs that I didn't get to cover tonight that cover uh, community generation, um, an ongoing challenge right now where we'll be selecting a project to fund to sort of pilot that model, um, which will hopefully sort of blaze the trail a little bit in Alberta for how municipalities can get involved in some of those larger power plant type of projects, whether it's from ownership or just from uh, involvement. And I'm hoping that will sort of, yeah, set the stage in the same way that microgeneration has been already set um, with municipalities for solar. Great, thanks. Mikhail, looks like he is. Yeah, just uh, if you don't mind, I can add to, uh, to Mark uh, from another side, from a solar perspective. Uh, this MCC, MCCAC program was absolutely exceptional because um, uh, it allowed, uh, under microgeneration, uh, you can build up to five megawatt projects, and uh, it provided a very essential bridge between where the industry was uh, before and uh, where the industry goes now. So, you know, there's a gap, obviously, in the size of the project that we've been doing um, two, three years ago, and um, with MCCC project uh, opportunities, you know, now projects uh, in the megawatt scale uh, range is built, and that's a great time and opportunity to fine-tune the local expertise and uh, provide the local labor and um, uh, resources for the future projects that's coming down the pipeline. 
So I guess just to add to that, because um, Canadian Solar was, we, we um, joined in part of the engagement to sort of, uh, as a working group, to look at the community generation. So that was also exciting to hear what municipalities wanted to do in solar. Um, I think for us, beyond the four projects that I showcased today, a lot of what we're looking at is in community-led and community-involved projects where we're actually trying to see, okay, what does the community want within their space? And also... How do we execute these projects without taking away their productive um, agricultural land and taking it out of service? So very much aligned with what we're seeing with that, but that was also uh, interesting to test around the room. Thank you very much. My question is to Mark. Um, you spoke about the Adri project, um, 1.2 megawatt. I'm an electrician. I like to know some of the technical things. The rest I consider to be PR, and everyone else fits in the same category. So tell us about with whom you intertied the grid, what the high voltage lines are, the main fuses, transformers, et cetera, something about three-phase balancing the circuit and other little interesting things behind that. Thank you. <laughs> I would love to answer your question. I'm probably not the right person to be asking it, though. We're, we're really more involved on the funding side. And, the, and if the, I don't know, were you guys okay. involved on that project? Did you, can That's you fine. Thank you. To save time, I will ask Dave uh, you can probably speak to the question because he's got master electrician like me. So please give us some details on one of the smaller projects. I can just have a look at it, something like a million and a half or so. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, so for the, uh, for the ARG project, uh, it was under the microgen regulation, so um, the connection to the actual service was on the existing distribution there. So there was an existing main distribution and just added a solar breaker, and all it does is backfeed. So um, the way, obviously, you know, as an electrician and the inverters work, they look at uh, the incoming power, they see it, they pair up with it, and then they sync and they pull in, and they just use the existing infrastructure, so it's actually relatively cheap to uh, get these microgen regulations online because you're using a lot of existing infrastructure. You're not pulling out new lines to the street or to the high voltage lines. You get to piggyback off of a lot of the existing infrastructure. So um, that was a layout on that project. Uh, on some of the uh, large ones, obviously, there's a, there's a limit on what was there existing. You know, when buildings were built, uh, usually you're not planning to put a, a monster utility scale <laughs> system on the roof. So uh, most of the times it works out. Sometimes you've got to do a little bit of retrofit. But um, uh, for the most part, there's enough bus capacity to put a lot of these systems in. Okay, mine, uh, my question is uh, mainly for uh, um, uh, Iona there with Canadian Solar. Uh, we were involved along with Mikhail and one out of the, when the first uh, larger uh, utility scale was brought into the province and that. And uh, the, the thing that we fought with, with a lot of it, was to have uh, Alberta contractors and employees and people in Alberta be able to work on these projects instead of having them brought in from other provinces and, and so forth. When we got a high unemployment and everything going on now, um, as Mikhail was saying, that, uh, that job there was done by the outfits in Ontario. Uh, all these big projects on the rooftops uh, two years ago, we had the same problem with IKEA. They come out here, they're putting on stuff on there. They brought in people from Toronto, the UK, and everybody else. We here in Alberta do building. We have a lot of trained people in this, along with Dave knows with uh, getting all these rooftop solars. There's other companies that have done the Leduc Rec Center, Camrose, all those jobs there, uh, um, and. Uh, Green Acres was done by an Alberta company. So we're hoping that Canadian Solar will come in and, and do these projects with Alberta companies and not uh, other companies from the UK or United States or whatever, if you don't mind. No, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, uh, for that question and that feedback. Um, I for us, it's, it is really important that we get people in Alberta actually working on the project. So as much as possible, as much as there's a, the amount of people that can deliver on a project is, is available, I believe that's what the people that would be doing the actual EPC would, would actually be focused on. Some of the, on the Alberta infrastructure project, that was one of the things that we had said we had a conference with the minister at the time, and it was how many jobs are you bringing into Alberta? And that was, that was what the conversation was around. So it's, goes, it's just to say to you that it's not a thing that is going over our head, it's a thing that is being, sort of is, is in the roadmap to actually execute the projects with, to create some jobs directly and indirectly at these sites. So point well taken, I'll take it back to the team as well, but thanks a lot for the feedback. David, did you have something to add? 
Uh, yeah, I do actually. Um, I'd have to say I completely agree with uh, everyone here on that, uh, and really the ball is in Alberta's court here. Um, if we leave it open to companies to come across from other parts of the world uh, or other provinces and compete uh, competitively with local, that just means our prices are too high. And it's, it's really on us, so uh, we got to be cognizant of our pricing, and that's why I think it's you know, been really instrumental with the grant agencies uh, driving some of the, the projects that we can be familiar with the pricing and, and you know, on the estimating end, we're ready and, and our, you know, our gun is cocked to go pull the trigger on these projects and actually execute. So um, I'd say the ball is in our court from, I guess, the contractor perspective, and uh, I really do think we can uh, obviously uh, procure and deliver these projects uh, cheaper than obviously anywhere else just due to LOA, paying guys extra labor. And they have to pay LOA. They yeah. LOA. Labor, labor, labor. No matter how you say it and how fast you say it, you still, it takes that time. So. My question is um, targeted to the utility scale and uh, particularly focused on the concept of oversupply. And Ioma, I think you touched on it in your presentation, but I'd, I'd open it up to any one of the four panelists, but I definitely want to hear your perspective as a solar developer. Um, with the recent reports that have been issued by the ASO talking about renewable capacity on our current transmission infrastructure, um, and some of the big utility scale projects like the Traverse project, for example, how serious is this oversupply uh, issue? And is it something that you're uh, focused on? Is it something that you're considering? And it, is it gonna impact the ability for renewable deployment in Alberta in the forthcoming years? So um, when I spoke about oversupply, I just mean it's not something that should be ignored. It's something that can happen. It's not a near term. Um, as we said, there are a bunch of projects that are in construction all at the same time and all expected to come on stream. But the reality is they might not all come on stream and all at the same time. So the, the point is the risk is there, but the risk is not right now. And it's just something to, for us to bear in mind. And hopefully we're hoping that we get to the point in, in, in Canada and just in general where we're able to do some sort of storage of power because that's something that's not really as uh, large in this market. Um, a, a, a large part of our team on the US side, we have a whole team of 40 people committed to only battery and storage, a single team. So it is in innovating with solar that we can then get to that point where we are not struggling with oversupply because we have that as an alternative. So it's a risk that can happen. It's not right now. We just see, as you, as you saw from his presentation, there's a lot of projects that are coming on stream now. So it's something that we don't want to ignore and say it's, it's never going to happen. We have to also mention it as part of the outlook for Alberta establishing as a solar uh, powerhouse. But the main thing is for us to push the innovation and see how much more we can do as far as solar is concerned, especially from an energy storage and battery perspective. But that's not something that we're in now, but obviously it's in view and hopefully we can leverage our teams that are sort of across the world to see how we can pull that into the Alberta market. So w within that ASO report, um, if I recall correctly, I think that it was broken down into three separate uh, categories for focused specifically around renewable deployment. And uh, it was the Southwest, Southeast and South Central. Uh, and it stated that the South Central had a zero, capa zero megawatt capacity. Uh, southeast was 130 and Southwest was something like 350, 360. Um, so I guess to what I've read through that report contradicts that to me that that's saying that there is an immediate issue. And if there is uh, this, you know, gigawatts of projects that are in the pipeline right now in the queue with ASO working through the stages for approvals with the, the AUC, um, that it is more of an immediate issue. Uh, but is that not the case? As far, I have to go read that and see like how it's broken down, but I just mean as far as now, there's still some runway for the projects to actually be deployed, right? We have till January 2020 for the first one, Southfield Utility Skill to come online. We have till 2021 for the other ones to come online. So that's what I mean from a perspective of a developer. We're still, we have some runway to see how the, to see how essentially it can be absorbed in the market. So I can't speak to that specific report because I haven't, I haven't uh, spent time to comb through it, but now that you raised it, I'll go have a look and then we can connect afterwards and just discuss further. I think that'll be 
Fantastic. I mean, we know we know through the sector that transmission constraints are directing um, and and influencing where people are are planning projects and and doing siting. So that that is taking place, and and um, you know the ASO has an obligation to get you your transmission lines if you have a project somewhere and you want to go forward with. But the reality is, it's going to be faster for you if you go to a spot where where there is existing um, access. So that is that is a part of what the private market is looking at for sure. Yeah. What are some challenges that you guys see for planned and unplanned projects from the current government, and what kind of strategies you have for those? Um, I, th I think one of the big things that affects it is the, the carbon pricing. I know it is uh, one of the revenue streams that the developers look at uh, when building these projects. So uh, when Canada places a focus on you know setting a price for that or actually uh, you know driving that, that does play a big role in the financials. So. Um, you know, depending on what government's in or what, who's driving the bus at the time, that does play, a, a, I guess, a role in the feasibility of these. So I guess uh, that would be one of the, the challenges uh, with the, the change in governments that I would see uh, as a, one of the direct relations to that. So I guess from our perspective, it is a change, but it's a change that we continue to expect with solar and with renewable energy in general. So it doesn't change our view on the market to just continue to work on projects here in Alberta, especially if you have a case where you're contracting some of the revenue on your projects, then you have some of that as a short cash flow into the project. So it is change, and I feel like as developers, as, as anybody, as stakeholders in the industry, you just always have to respond to that change and see how much or how quickly you, you can de-risk some of your um, project risk and then sort of proceed from there. So it is change, but it's a thing where you just adapt and see how much you can lock in value in your projects. But I also add that um, the way how the market works, the fact that it's energy only market uh, deregulated also play a big role. So if the next government comes in and decided to change the market structure to capacity market, it's gonna be huge uh, risk for whomever is providing offtake agreements. So that you know needs to be stabilizing because we're talking about investments for 25 plus years, and uh, we cannot just uh, you know allow the market to change all over the place. Uh, same thing you know happened with um, you know coal um, investors in the coal plants uh, when when the greenhouse gas market uh, came into play, and um, they've been affected. And as you know, it, it's been kind of a battle between the government and those developers. So there's certainly a huge risk involved in, in, in doing these projects. And talking about the oversupply, you know, if you look at the big picture, I know that ASO is always kind of on the shy side for the renewable energy, but if you look at the big picture, um, you need to ask the question, do we as a society allow another coal plant to be built in Alberta? So, you know, I think with the pressure from, uh, and the urgency of the climate change, um, I don't think that's gonna happen personally. So if it's not going to happen and we're going to retire, we're going to let uh, our existing coal plants to retire. That's a huge capacity because 450 meg uh, megawatt coal plant is lots to replace uh, with uh, whatever it is, and uh, you know whether it's going to be coming from uh, natural gas uh, peaking units because natural gas is low or renewables. It's kind of open question, and I do believe that a uh, good share of that going to be renewables. And, and I guess also to add to that, I, I think we've seen it recently is the local labor laws that. Uh, it does affect the projects uh, on the on the installation side. So, like we've seen with the NDP, uh, you know, they had changed the labor laws to do with overtime agreements, um, and now the UCP and clawing it back and bringing it back to how it used to be. You know, that does play a big role in the actual cost to build these projects. Um, uh, like you were saying before, the uh, you got the seasons of uh, winter and summer and mud and freezing, and you, it's like farming. You make hay when the sun is shining, and if you got a labor law saying no, nope, can't work over eight hours, and you got guys coming in from out of town. And now you got to pay overtime. That all it does is start driving the, the project costs. So um, I'm really glad that you know the UCP market got in and kind of scrapped that back to what it used to be uh, to bring the cost down. So there is uh, definitely some volatility uh, on that side of things.